How is it that politicians and people in the public can lie and get away with it? I'm Justin Hitt from Inside Strategic Relations. This is why critical thinking is so important. Your ability to think rationally about situations, to research and gather evidence, to make qualified decisions is a massive and powerful thing. And and here's why. Every day you'll see politicians lie about something in the media. Now, I'm not going to go into specific lies because there's emotional elements to it. I'm going to go into the concept and mechanism that allows these lies to go unpunished. Political figures, medical figures, people in the media, people in big business have all been caught in lies from time to time, yet the general public will forget almost instantly of these misdeeds. Why is that? First off, the general public is not qualified to judge the behavior of professionals. So if a doctor lies about a medical procedure or an activity or they provide advice that is inaccurate, the authority of the doctor is held to a higher standard than the validation of the information. Uh, One thing that happens right now is folks will be accused of a conspiracy theory. So they'll say, well, hey, so an authority will say this is why such and such is happening. And someone else will say, well, well, what if it's this other thing? The alternative view is immediately shot down as a conspiracy, as some uh, unhinged uh, uh, view of what's going on. Now, why does this happen as well? Well, first off, again, if an authority comes out, if a celebrity comes out and says something is the way it is, our brains tend to say, okay, well, they're important, so therefore they must be right. It's kind of a shortcut. Because when we developed in evolution, we were in small communities, and if a leader in your community said something was a certain way, such as a religious authority, such as a political authority... You, you really didn't lose much if you didn't believe if you if you just simply believe them. It was easy to simply believe them. Also, if you didn't believe them, you could walk away more easily and not have to to deal with it. So, in your social circles, if someone tells lies all the time, you have less risk associated with not believing those lies. And everybody knows this. So in their day-to-day relationships, you know people lie, and when they lie, you know not to trust them. You avoid them. You, you know, you just do your due diligence and you avoid them. But when a celebrity says something or when a political figure says something, especially if they're aligned in your own political beliefs, the, you suspend those elements because if there were 10 things that this person believes and nine out of those 10 things you also agree with, that other item you're kind of kind of overlook. And it's just the way the brain works. Now, what we have to do is have a healthy suspicion, not a paranoia, but a healthy suspicion that what if the per, the primary belief is not true? You know, what are the possibilities? What is the evidence? What is the, uh, the position? Now, with this whole COVID thing, a lot of folks are saying, follow the science. Okay, which specific science are we following? Were there any counter studies were there any uh, opposition or, or arguments against this uh, topic? If one organization does this and has a success, there's a uh, co- confirmation bias or a selection bias because maybe that's the only company that did anything. And maybe there are other factors that contributed to success, not just the fact that they did this X one thing. So we see in companies, they talk about Jeff Bezos. Oh, he's, you know, Amazon is so powerful because Amazon made all products available to all people online. And well, maybe not. Maybe it's because they have a, a lot of revenue coming in from becoming a marketplace. Maybe they have a lot of revenue coming in by selling their technology where Google actually was keeping their technology internal. And then later when Google started selling their technology, they grew. You know, most of Google's revenues are from advertising. They're not from the technology from, from Google itself. It's from the, uh, the Google being a marketplace, which technically is similar to what Amazon's doing as Amazon's a marketplace. See, when you question things and when you drill down into concepts and ideas, you very often find new stuff, new information. 
oh wait, maybe it's a more powerful position to bring customers together or bring uh, buyers and sellers together than it is to be a retail store because Walmart sold just about everything. Sears sold just about everything. Another concept that happens too is that there are too many decisions to be made. So we do tend to defer to authority to make the decisions for us. Now again, in a massive scale, it doesn't work at all. In fact, it breaks down because you get what's called groupthink. You get a um, kind of a, a hive mindset. So what do we do? First off, we have to ask ourselves, is this something I need to have a decision? I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are whole societies of people that don't watch the news. They don't watch TV. They just mind their day-to-day life and they just do what they do and they have very little stress and not saying they have no stress, but uh, Amish communities, for example, they're living in what would technically be 18th century. No technology, no automobiles, no computers, no uh, electricity, and they do just fine. I'm not advocating that you get rid of these things, but I, I'm advocating that you expand your scope of solution. You ask the question when someone says, hey, we're going to solve this with technology, energy crisis. We're going to solve this with technology. Well, could we solve it without technology? If we used less energy, could the forms of energy we have today be sufficient? If we use less energy, could a new technology be sufficient? See, this is a questioning, but we have to say, is this a value to me? Does this fit my goals? Does this fit my needs? Does it really matter to me? And there's a, a, a removal from your purview, some of the choices that really just don't matter. You know, when you go out to eat, does it really matter what you pick off the menu? Unless you have an allergy, it doesn't really matter. Now, you don't necessarily want to pick the same thing every time, but you don't need to spend 20 minutes making a decision. You can look at the menu, pick the... Uh, pick a category. So here's a creative thinking exercise. You could pick a category and then within that category, just pick a number and then try whatever's on the menu. You'll experience new things. You'll have uh, new uh, new opportunities. Um, but when it comes to the day-to-day thinking that you're doing, there are a lot of decisions you don't need to make. I think people are making like 30,000 decisions a day. What if you only need to make 10 really important decisions instead of 10,000 just doesn't really matter decisions. You'll see a lot of uh, people that are applied to be very smart wear the same clothes every day. They have two or three outfits because they don't want to spend decision power. And there is such thing as decision fatigue when you make too many decisions. Um, They don't want to spend decisions on things that don't really have any, like which shoes you're going to wear. If you only got two pairs of shoes, then it's just a lot easier just to wear a pair of shoes. Uh, a bigger point here I want to bring up is the reason that masses believe things that aren't true is because there is a sphere of social pressure. So when you're making a decision, you got to ask yourself, why am I making this decision? Am I making this decision because I'm being pressured by society? I'm being pressured by my family. I'm being pressured by my work environment. There are many people today that spend years in a job that is not good for them because they just... I already made the decision. They want to stick with it. They don't want to be quitters. They want to stick with their decision. Yet it's something that is not uh, good for them. It is not healthy for them. It's it's uh, muting their desires. Overall, it's important to understand that our brains, the way we think and the way we process information is not rational. The rationality is the framework for optimizing those decisions. So some people say, let's just go with our heart. I'm going to make a decision based on what, you know, how, what feels right. Well, that works if you've ingested a large amount of information and a variety of information to support both sides of an argument. And then you're now going to sit down and just choose a side based on your feeling about the overall activity. But if you just simply go with your feelings... There's no basis for that decision. If you have to make a decision where you're accountable to a third party, you're going to take and approach that decision a different way than if you're just accountable to yourself. Because you could have decided not to eat a piece of cheesecake today and then tomorrow eat two pieces because you didn't eat a piece yesterday and obviously you deserve a piece today because you were so good at not eating a piece yesterday. See, we rationalize rationalize, use emotions And we often make poor decisions. So what's the last piece of advice? 
Well, first off, I told you how we need to use better, more critical thinking. And then I told you how our brains kind of just are everywhere. How do we frame better decisions? Well, I'm going to advocate that you use a external source or an external framework, such as writing down a question and answering the question. So what is your thesis? And then writing a response. So a more formal approach to decision making. I'm advocating using research and using unusual sources. So instead of just getting your news from YouTube, going to primary sources and a research library. I'm also advocating using a decision matrix or weighted decision tools. Now, I'm not going to go into how each of these work, but you're probably asking the question, well, that's a lot. It seems like a lot of effort to make decisions. So I would, I would allow for emotional, irrational decisions in areas that are not as important, like what kind of clothes you're going to wear. Uh, and I would advocate that we use a more formal approach for larger decisions that impact other people or impact ourselves over time. I know in a 15 minute podcast, we can't really go into uh, how the brain perceives the world around you. How when you're inside of a group, you're going to bias some decisions and not know that you're biasing those decisions or that you're going to follow other decisions because of the factors we talked about here. Having so many choices, it's just one choice is as good as the other. Um, And then we're not going to talk about how you can frame concepts so that people automatically choose the choice that you wanted them to make. This is more about being aware that our thinking process is flawed and it's a natural function. Sometimes it's optimization, um, you know, like when you're in a wilderness situation, if it's red, we'll make you dead. It's it kind of a, a, a thumb rule about food that you might find in the wilderness that will make you sick if you eat it. Yet apples and cherries are red. So the rule is, is it doesn't fit in every situation, but it's ideal for its specific application. I'm starting to realize I've jumbled this up a little bit. I want to make sure that if you have any questions that you contact my office. If you've got a big decision, a million dollar decision, I can show you on paper how to make a better decision. So in the business world, it might be cash flow projections. In the business world, it might be uh, testing concepts rather than going straight into a final decision. And in the business world, it might be anything other than a consensus. In your personal life, if you have big decisions to make, sometimes any decision is better than no decision at all. What I'm having trouble conveying is how do you know which situation is best? Should you just go with an emotion? Should you just go with any decision? Or should you have a detailed decision? And again, that's weighing, weight on the value and the, uh, the, what's at stake. It's also weighted on uh, how many times have you made this decision before and what have been the outcomes. It's also weighted on how do you track your performance? Are you measuring your performance so that you would know if you make a bad decision, if it sends you in the wrong direction? And then finally, are are you in a peer group that is going to provide you objective feedback, like a mastermind that doesn't really have anything at stake, but they ultimately um, rely on you for good advice, so they want to give you the best advice they can so that you reciprocate? Um, That's a different situation than family group that doesn't care, and they're wondering why all these years you haven't got a real job, even though you're making a million dollars a year in a business. I'm Justin Hit with Inside Strategic Relations, and I have attempted to share with you some of the complex challenges with how thinking works, how in large groups people make the weird-ass decisions for so many irrational reasons, and how individually we tend to make better decisions because we have tools and perspective If you have any questions about what I've shared, visit me at www.insidestrategicrelations.com. I'm here to help high-income professionals and entrepreneurs transform business relationships into profits. We use critical thinking, influence, and social dynamics in order to position you to achieve more. Thanks for listening.